excited to have this panel today. Um, and the way um, we're going to do this is going to go just through a very quick round where uh, each of the people on the person on the panel is going to introduce themselves. Uh, then we'll try to have about, I would say, 40 minutes of discussion uh, on the topic for today uh, and some Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, do not hesitate to put them in the Zoom chat or um, on one of the Google Doc that we have uh, set on the side. Um, and uh, some questions, uh, I think that I'll try to monitor the chat and I might just ask them as we go because that might really help with um, people everyone understanding what um the topic discussed uh, is about exactly or if you need clarification do not hesitate to ask um and at the very end we'll just have a quick sort of wrap up um of this whole uh panel uh okay um so i'm um, just going to start the round of uh introduction uh, and so, hi, my name is uh, Remy Go, and my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm currently based in Brussels, uh, and I do, I'm doing, I'm a postdoctorate in, neuros, in neuroimaging, I do mostly a lot of uh, fMRI, and I do have a background in, in biology, and as many scientists, I was never trained to sort of write code or curate data, and I have suffered a lot um, because of that, and um, and that's also why I wanted to sort of have this discussion about um, what is clean code and how it can help people um, in academia, and uh, what we can also learn from some of the practices that already exist in uh, industry. And then I think I'm just going to turn to whoever in our guests list want to sort of jump in or should I just point people? Uh, Feline, am I pronouncing your name right? Yes, yeah, you're pronouncing my name right. So as yours, if you want to introduce yourself. Okay, hello everyone, my name is Feline Hermans. I'm a social professor at Leiden University and my research concerns mainly the intersection between educational science and cognitive science and programming. So I research how people learn programming, how you can teach programming both to absolute beginners, how to get them to their first programming experience, but also for professional programmers, how to use what we know about cognitive science to be more effective programmers. And thirdly, also, how we can design programming languages and programming systems in such a way that they create less cognitive loads for the users of programming languages and programming systems. So those are my areas of expertise. Cool, awesome, thank you. Uh, Jade, you wanna go next? Sure, thanks Remy. Um, so uh, my name is Jade Abbott. Um, I go by the pronouns uh, she, her. I am currently based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, I also have two kilograms of rooibos tea in my, <laughs> in my closet at the moment. Um, they sell them by the kilo, um, which is great. Um, my current activity is, I go by kind of two hats, is I'm kind of a, a senior software engineer or lead, lead engineer um, for a South African software company called RetroRabbit. I work specifically in the machine learning space, um, even more specifically in AI and machine learning to do with text data. So anything to do with natural language. Um, and I, in my free time, I work on a open research initiative um, called Masakane, where the goal is to do open research for African languages. So around the AI space, but specifically looking at African languages, because those are very underrepresented. So Masakane is this big uh, community where we, where we try to address that. Um, so those are sort of my, my, my two hats. I have traditionally got a computer science background um, and have moved back and forth between kind of industry and research um, the entire time. Fantastic, thank you. Um, next, Adora, you want to go? Or yes, to... sure. Uh, I'm going to turn on my video now, just so that everyone can see me, at least for just the introduction. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Adora, and I am a software engineer at Microsoft. I work on cloud services that allow different engineers all around the world build mixed reality experiences. So um, more on the cloud engineering side. 
um, you would find me doing things on the core backend side. You would find me doing stuff on the infrastructure side or doing some kinds of security compliance work. And that's basically just it. I don't think it's just it. That's already quite a lot if you ask me. <laughs> 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 Do not like diminish what you actually managed to accomplish for sure. Uh, Yo, you want to go next? Awesome. Uh, so, hey everyone, uh, my name is Yo. Uh, you can use any pronouns that work for you, work for me, um, but they and she are ones that are most common. Um, and I am currently the open source technology lead at the Wellcome Trust in a team called the Data for a Science and Health team. Uh, I've been a coder for about 20 years, um, but these days I don't write much code. Uh, I spend a lot more time worrying about whether or not we are making sure that code is well done um, in the scientific research and ecosystem. Um, and I sort of started teaching myself, um, you know, um, as a teenager in my bedroom um, at, when I was about 15. And I sort of just did my career completely backwards. I learned how to code. I got my bachelor's whilst working full time. And actually, by the time I graduated, I was working as a research software engineer at Cambridge um, before I even got my bachelor's completely finished, because it took me a very, very long time to get there. Um, and so now, full time working and worrying about the open source software and science and research. Um, and also a PhD student because, again, I like to do things backwards, um, but very excited to talk to you all today. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks. Uh, and I think last we have uh, Patrick, I think you're next. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm uh, Patrick Minot. I'm in, uh, uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm in uh, Montreal currently, uh, Canada. Um, so I, uh, I'm doing uh, um, uh, data science uh, for, uh, for neuroscience consulting. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I started with a PhD in uh, neuroscience at uh, McGill University, uh, did a little postdoc at uh, UCLA, and then I was broke, so I went to industry. Um, so I uh, uh, did a, so I was a software engineer actually at Google. Um, and uh, then I went uh, to do, uh, uh, engineering on uh, the BCI team at, uh, at Facebook, uh, which, you know, allowed me to pick up some, uh, some, some things about some industry practices and to look back at what I lived through, uh, during my PhD. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot about how I could uh, have done things better. Uh, and, uh, uh, I create workshops, uh, uh, I'm currently creating a workshop on, um, on writing uh, good code that uh, we're going to unveil at uh, Neuromatch Academy. So we're hoping to have uh, a few hundred people uh, attend there. Uh, so I'm, I'm also here to plug this. Brilliant, yes. Uh, looking forward for that, to that one as well. Okay, uh, so I think maybe- to Your sound is still yeah. quite scratchy, just, just yeah. notifying you. Yeah, thanks. Good, better? Okay, thanks. I, I, I swear my computer and I are going to have a little chat after this. Um, okay, so maybe just to get us started, I have a, like a, lo a list of, you know. Uh, Remy, you should perhaps make it a little bit less sensitive. I think yeah, but. Okay, or well, maybe I can switch like this. Is that better? Much better. Okay, I'll do like this then. No headphones. Uh, I'll try to keep an eye on this. Okay, um, so I have a list of topics that we could uh, talk about um, today. I think maybe to just to get us started would be um, uh, what maybe what what do we mean by good code or clean code? And I, I know this could be like, this could go on for a very long time. So uh, maybe just have a, a bit of round the table. Um, I like you know just. If someone asks you that in an elevator and you've got 30 seconds to give them like your uh, response, what, what would you go for uh, as a definition of clean, good code? Uh, I could start pointing at people, but you can also decide to yeah. just jump in right away if you want. I'm happy to jump in. Uh, so to me, clean code is code that is tested or testable. Simple as that. We can iterate on the details, but that's step one. Okay. 
anyone else want to sort of have their take on this? Yeah, so maybe I can give the perspective from the programming community, because I think it's interesting for you to know this if you start Googling clean code and stuff like that, how you should interpret what you're reading there. So most of the clean code rules are written by programmer engineering like people that really need rules. So if you read those clean code blogs, then people might say stuff like, oh, a method should never be longer than 10 lines. Then it is clean code or variable names shouldn't be longer than 25 characters. That is clean code and other things aren't clean code. Programmers tend to be a bit um, yeah, engineering based, a bit STEM based on, oh, it should be measurable. If it's not measurable, then it isn't clean code. So like the previous speaker said, testable pro programmers might say something like 95% uh, test coverage. And so very often talking about clean code is in our community, not necessarily done in technical terms uh, or in cognitive terms, like it should be understandable or it shouldn't be too hard on the working memory. But very often people lean towards quantitative methods saying it should be this number of that quantity, which isn't necessarily always the best way to measure it. We could talk another hour about whether or not that is good. But I just wanted to add this perspective that if you read these things, then you know that this is what uh, many professional programmers, like what they're coming from. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to address their, their own definition? I, I think that when you say clean code, you're thinking about, ask yourself this question. Am I writing code that other people can read? Am I writing code that I can read if I come back to this in 20 days, in 20 years, in 20 hours? That's the most important thing to think about. Clean is relative. The fact that your code looks neat, you know, in terms of all oh, that it's short and it's precise, doesn't actually mean that it's readable. And I think that that's one, that's the big thing that should actually be addressed. You should try, when you're thinking about clean code, you should be thinking about the fact that is this code that I'm writing readable for me? or for the next person without comments? Is this, or even with comments, and obviously the comments should be as moderate as they can be. Is this code that I'm writing testable? Is this code that I am writing, if maybe I'm in the object-oriented programming context, is this code that I'm writing obey, obeying these five principles of object-oriented programming? Am I writing solid code at the end of the day these are things that you know should come to our minds when we're thinking about whether or not we are writing clean code or when we're trying to define what clean code is thank you um patrick you want to have your your go in this uh, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that uh, to, to add to Jade's point, uh, I think that having a behavior defined in, uh, in some sort of way that you can look back to and say, like, this is correct according to the spec or this behavior that I define. And of course, you know, we're going to advocate later for, for like testing based uh, specs. Um, I, I think that that's what constitutes uh, uh, clean code. It's it's quite possible to pick up uh, like code from somebody else uh, that you know looks like it works, but you have no way of checking. <laughs> it's really infuriating. Um, so that's that's my two cents. I think we have you. We have not. Like, do you want to? Do you want to also just jump in there? Totally. Uh, so first of all, I want to echo that I think the biggest thing about uh, code is is a human problem. Uh, so sort of echoing what Adora and Philin said that writing stuff that other people can come and understand is the single most important thing. Or the, or the way I like to think about it, I mean, I know we're at an, a, an event where the name starts with open. Uh, so I probably don't have to sell you too hard on why open is important, but I'm a messy person, right? Um, and my living room is a lot tidier if someone else is coming around. So if you write your code like you're expecting someone else to see it, you're a lot more likely to be writing stuff that's clean and tidy. Um, so write it for other people who are coming around to see your messy living room. <laughs> Great. So I think, I think we've got like human readability. Uh, we've got defining 
so I want your, your code downs and testing uh, seems, seems to be some of the, the, the important aspects there. Um, I think before we move on, because someone has mentioned test and which I'd be tempted to maybe before we move on, because I'm not sure that everyone in the audience will be familiar with those. So maybe we should um, have a brief explanation of what that is. Um, if anyone uh, wants to just uh, try to define that in terms that almost anyone could understand. Uh, Remy, I think you, your sound is, is being a bit, is a bit. Once again, I've got. Robot to you again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll do that again. So yeah. then, um, I suspect that's better. Uh, if, if anyone wants to sort of have a go at trying to give a, an explanation of what they mean by testing code, uh, I suspect that, uh, I guess a lot of people would think, okay, that's just, you have a human being who's gonna sit in front of the computer and just, click buttons to make sure that the software does what it's supposed to do. And I don't exactly think that's what uh, we mean in that case. And also what we mean maybe by, by coverage. I think that um, the issue of metrics uh, and measuring what the code does uh, has been mentioned, but maybe we should just clarify that a little bit. So if anyone wants to sort of have a go at uh, explaining what those things are. Or I can try and then correct me. <laughs> I think Jade, oh, uh, no. um, so I think at least coming from software engineering, when we're talking, or oh, when I'm talking about testing, um, there, there are very many different kinds of testing. Um, but the nicest tests to have and the most useful tests are automated tests. So tests such as a, a unit test, which tests a specific piece of code. And what's really nice about that is typically when you're setting up these tests, you state this is what the thing needs to do. And then you have a piece of test, a piece of code that tests that the thing does what it says it does. So often it's uh, quite helpful from a readability perspective to say, I don't know what this code does. Let me go read what the tests say it does and should see that it, that's what it does. Um, so typically you write up, uh, every time you write some code, you write a piece of test, which you can run again later and then look back on and say, okay, it's still working. What this enables is for you to change, uh, to clean up your code, to make it more readable, to, to perhaps even optimize it with, with knowing that it's still sort of working um, because you've got the test that runs every time you make these changes. Um, and you build up, uh, we've been on projects where you've got thousands and thousands of these tests, um, depending on the type of project. But I think, uh, yeah, it's a, if for me, it's a really good to check because I change lots of stuff and I don't know what breaks. So it's really helpful to have those, those tests. Um, what was the second part of the question? I can't remember. Uh, maybe coverage. Coverage. So coverage, I have, I, I'll tell, I'll explain what it is and then I'll explain my opinions about it. So test coverage, what, you know, code uh, has, um, coverage is basically how much of your, how many, you know, how much of your, your code has actually been tested by the tests that you've written. So um, if you've got like an if statement, do you test both ends of the if statement? Do you have a test that tests um, that if it's true, uh, what happens when it's true is correct? Do you have a test that when uh, it's false, uh, what, what, what does it do the correct thing? Um, so you kind of trying to, with, with coverage, it's a metric to measure how much of your code is tested. Um, and you'll hear software engineering people talking about this. Uh, people will often aspire to have, oh, I want 80% code test coverage, um, which means that, you know, 80% of the paths in your code have been tested. Um, my opinions around it are, it's more of a bragging metric that people like to show, throw around because it doesn't, you can test lots of all the parts of your code badly. Sometimes you only want to test the really complicated stuff. So, and like make sure that's well tested 100% and the rest of it you sort of know. So I, yeah, that's my feeling around coverage. <laughs> Good, anyone uh, wants to have a go at uh, um, the metrics and some of the issues around metrics? <laughs> Or maybe if you want to add something on like readability metrics, for example, if there are some. Yeah, so I think the point that I was trying to make in the, in the first round that I'll make a little bit more clearly is that I don't think these, I think also what Jade is saying that these metrics are more, sometimes become a goal rather than a way to decide if your code is actually well written and maintainable. So people strive for 100% coverage or 95% coverage, but this can also be done with 
weak tests and you say, oh, all my methods are just 10 lines long. Now I have maintainable code. So this is also very, all, very much this engineering perspective that I think ultimately distracts a bit from what you're trying to do. So I think the point about this clean room, if you get a visitor, that actually is a, is a very good point. So I think we should step away a bit from these metrics and we should think more, if I look at this code, uh, three months from now, do I still understand it? And I think that very often if people use comments in code or if they choose names in code, then they are writing down more what they are doing than why they are doing this. So common, a common comment, for example, would be, oh, here I'm into implementing this and this algorithm, which is sort of useful, but it would be even more useful if you would say, here I'm choosing this specific algorithm with these parameters because uh, maybe I tried three different ones that all didn't work really well. So this is the one that I ended up choosing. And that's a comment that will really help someone else coming into the code understand why is this code the way it is? And I think that's something that is also very important in clean code. So yeah, of course you want to have good variable names. And of course you want to have short methods that are a bit more readable than these hundred line programs. But I think the most important part is does this code help a future reader? That could be me in the future. Does it help a future reader to understand why is the code in, written in the way it is? Why do I need these hyperparameters? Or why do I need to do this and this? Or why do I need to uh, see if a variable is null or something? I think those are more important than simply focusing on the length of a method or the coverage or whatever metric you can come up with. This is harder, of course, as well. It is nice to have a metric. It's nice to think, oh, I want to have 100% test coverage and you have 100% test coverage. Things. Okay, so eh, I'm happy. I'm happy about myself. I can, I can chill. I can be in peace about the state of my code. Thinking about uh, empathizing with your own future self or other people reading the code is just a lot, a lot harder to measure. When do I have it correct? I don't, I want to quickly say something, which is that I don't think that having metrics are necessarily a bad thing. And I'm saying that because we are talking about clean code and having good test coverage isn't like, for me, it has nothing to do with how clean your code is. You can have clean code and decide to write tests and have a hundred percent coverage. You can have terrible written code and decide to write tests and have 100% coverage. Tests basically should help you feel confident about the code you wrote. The fact that your code isn't clean doesn't actually mean that it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So when we're talking about clean code, we're talking about, like you said, code being readable for the future reader, which in everybody's defense could even be you, right? But when you're thinking about like a, I don't think at some point we should um, not focus on metrics and try to make sure that we write clean code because I do not think that both of them are mutually exclusive. I think that I think that we should, as well as we try to write code that is better, clean, and visible for people, we should also, when we're thinking about testing our code, try to write tests that are fully functional and actually test the components that we're supposed to be testing and not writing and actually test the components that we're supposed to be testing and not writing tests that don't help us but writing actual good tests and in that light testing going to test as much as we can in our code meaning maybe getting some kind of high code coverage because the fact that your code is really covered or the fact that your code is not covered, your, your code cannot be covered and your code is clean, but that doesn't help you because you could mistakenly write, you could mistakenly introduce a bug into clean code that because you don't have tests, you might not catch. And going into production, that might be a serious problem. I just wanted to point that out. Wants, wants to just carry on on this. I uh, had a couple of uh, threads I, I did briefly want to comment on. So one was um, actually, I think, Philan, you mentioned the um, comments aren't always useful. Um, and for example, you might say that clean code is well-commented code. 
but I had an example when I was early on when I was developing, I was learning how to um, adjust WordPress themes. So this is um, visual design for websites. And there was a line in the theme that I was modifying that said, if you delete this line, the sky will fall on your head. I still don't know what would have happened. Like really, like why, why not to delete it? Um, and I never did delete it, but I just don't know what the deal was. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's not exactly the most helpful comment you faced there, <laughs> for sure. I would have immediately deleted that line. <laughs> immediately. Just to see what happens. <laughs> it's like a big red button that says, don't press me. <laughs> yep, definitely. Um, I think um, um, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure where, where I want to go from that on that next one. Uh, maybe um, there's one aspect that I think that I want to take out of this session, for example, is what, what would be advice is that you would have given to people or to, to, that you would give to people who are starting or to even to yourselves when you started coding? Uh, let me, let me. We can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> like we hear sounds, but it's very hard to hear the words. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Good. Okay. Very sorry about that. Uh, we're getting all the problems on this, on this, on the one on the first day, as usual. Um, uh, so yeah, no, I wanted, um, I wanted to sort of see whether uh, we could um, get out from the session some advices as well. So I'd, I'd be tempted to sort of ask you what what you would say to people starting um, programming who have little or no experience when it comes to programming. What um, or for example, what you wish you had known when you started, uh, when it came to like writing sort of clean code or code that you can e more easily work with in the future. So oh, I, I can take that one if I, if I may. Um, so because I'm going to do a bit of marketing here as well, because I actually just wrote a book uh, and I think my book contains many of the things I would have wanted to know when I started to program. So uh, I'll put a link in the chat if people want to uh, read it. It is out as an ebook early access program. So my book is about cognition, actually. So I'm a software engineer by training. I have a PhD in software engineering and I had no clue how brains worked. And that one turned out to be not very helpful. So I think just a, a little bit of understanding of working memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, and how those things interact when you are programming is very, very useful. And this very much also relates to clean code. There are like six chapters in my book that are about clean code. Because very often if we talk about clean code, if we by that mean code that is easy to understand, you have to know what things in general are easy to understand and how do we even understand things. So clean code often has to do with how easy is it to chunk code. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this audience is a bit more familiar with cognitive science than I was 10 years ago. So chunking, like dividing information into small uh, blobs. For me, clean code is code that makes it easy to chunk to make it easy to recognize pieces. If you always program in a certain style and then suddenly code is written in a different style, then that might still technically be correct. But then just because you're not used to it, then it takes your brain extra energy to process. And for example, variable names, if you have something like the maximum velocity, do you write max velocity or velocity max? It doesn't really matter, but if half your code base is max and then the units and the other half is the units and then max or max and maximum, stuff like that, then it just takes more energy to scan and to find information. So I think very often clean code is consistent code, not because consistency is necessarily a desirable property, but because consistency enables your brain to quickly process code. So uh, me coming from a programming background, not knowing anything about cognition, I really wished I had a deeper understanding of what happens in my brain if I process code. Like I had all the understanding of what a computer does with my code, but I had like zero understanding of what happens in your brain. And I think talking about clean code, you also have to talk about understanding. And if you talk about understanding, you always have the human in the loop. So you have to know a bit about human cognition as well. If you want to know more, buy my book. It was a lot of effort to, to write it. So please read my book. Definitely in my uh, to do to buy list for sure to read list. 
anyone else uh, has comments for their past selves or recommendations for their past selves or uh, people who are starting now? Patrick? Uh, yeah, so I think that the I, I think that a lot of people that are here are probably in the situation that they're maybe they just started out grad school or they've been in grad school for a uh, for a few years now and they've had to pick up like lots of code from other people like earlier in the earlier in the lab and uh, so that happens you know when when somebody is is uh, um, they get into like a very computational lab, uh, you know, they just have to like write lots of code uh, all of a sudden and picking up somebody's code is a terrible, terrible way to learn. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the right thing to do is um, it, because the complexity of code that is written by an expert in like some subject is, uh, is very high. So, you know, like picking up a, 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 a code project from scratch uh, like a pretty elaborate code project is one of the hardest tasks as a software engineer that you need to do. So, you know, if you're getting into grad school and you have this kind of problem, I say like, it's fine, you know, like just do what you need to do to, to finish this project. But at the same time, you, you have to like learn how to code in a, a more structured fashion, you know, using a traditional uh, curriculum. So, uh, you know, there's kind of a concept of, of um, having learning which is appropriate for your level of development and a lot of the stuff that might happen in this uh, in this course that you picked up from the grad student that was before you may be like way over your head and you know there's no amount of of looking at the code that's going to make it any better um so and and that happens at the, at every level you know when i uh when i started as a software engineer at uh at google i had a uh a starter project and the starter project was way over my head and it's still not done. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so start with uh, things which are, you know, appropriate and, 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 and learn from books, you know, uh, learning from books is often easier than um, learning from old code. That's a good, that's a good advice, definitely. Uh, I think you had some, you wanted to jump in and uh, you had something to say. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my favorite top secret secret is real programmers copy paste. Uh, <laughs> it is so okay to look at whatever code someone else wrote and reuse it. Of course, make sure to acknowledge licensing terms um, and not copy and paste anything you don't have the right to, to reuse. But it is the most common thing. I mean, that is how I certainly started um, 20 years ago. I would right click on a web page, I would view source. And then I would figure out how to make my font color yellow because, you know, I had to be yellow. Um, and also the other thing is that while I just said real program with copy and paste, type it. Don't just copy and paste because if you type it, you're thinking through what the things happen as you type them rather than just seeing if it runs. It's like, it's just like a, I don't know, I feel like Phil and maybe you have some, some cognitive trick explanation for why this helps you remember it better, <laughs> but this is just like a personal anecdotal feeling. Typing it really helps. <laughs> And also, if I may add to that, so it's definitely true that copy pasting is totally okay. And also looking up code is absolutely okay. Stack Overflow and Google is really filled with information that you can use. However, like cognitively, you don't need to, like you, you shouldn't like spoil your brain too much. So if you always look up everything, then you never learn anything. So there's some like collective wisdom from programmers that say, oh, you know, you don't need to learn syntax because you can just look everything up which is true, but of course it, you also pay in efficiency. If you, if you move to France from the Netherlands and you want to read the newspaper, yeah, you can put every word in Google Translate. This is possible. It will just be really, really, really slow and you'll make mistakes in copy pasting. So you want to have some sort of base vocabulary of the language uh, or the, the API audience. that you are using. Um, so you, you can really train this actually like a natural language. So you can, for example, use flashcards with the 20 or 50 most common API calls or concepts that you need to use. And you can really put the name on one side of the card and then the concept on the other side, and you can just train yourself. So of course, Googling and looking up is entirely okay. I still look up parts of syntax, but in addition to that, for the languages that I use often, I also have this base vocabulary of stuff that I don't have to look up and that does give 
speed and it does give also like a lower working memory load because looking up every word is just super duper slow and it feels a bit weird in the beginning to train this vocabulary but if you have a bit of vocabulary you will really be uh, quicker in reading and writing codes. Good. Um, any other advice? Otherwise, I'm, I'm tempted to maybe open the box uh, that uh, Patrick mentioned a bit earlier about test-driven development. Uh, so maybe Patrick, do you want to explain to us, now that we've, we've talked a bit earlier about what tests are, so what is the idea of test-driven development? I'm pretty sure that many of the people on the panel were obviously know what this is. Uh, I doubt that many people in research or in academia know what this is. So maybe we'll just take a bit of time just to explain what the idea is behind this. Sorry, Remy, um, could you quickly repeat that? Because I don't think any everyone's heard what you said. Sorry. Uh, perhaps. To quickly summarize, he's just asking what is test-driven development and uh, typically it might be that in academia we're not trained to be looking at that or trained to be coding that way but uh, from Patrick's experience perhaps we can talk about that and I guess from the experiences of everyone on the panel. Yeah, uh, definitely, thank you. Um, so test-driven development is the practice of, you know, writing code which is oriented towards tests. Uh, like one extreme version of this is uh, you write the code, uh, you write the tests first, uh, and then you write uh, the code in order to satisfy the test that you wrote. Um, so that's one model uh, that, you know, may, may not be like flexible enough for, uh, uh, for what you want to do. Um, a, but the idea is that you know you can um, even if you don't like go to this uh, to this extreme, you can still uh, have in mind a model where you incrementally improve the quality of your code by writing more and more tests that uh, you know define the behavior of your of uh, of your code as uh, as you're writing it. Now that sounds like um, pretty you know like complicated and maybe like a little bit abstract for uh for people who haven't experienced this and what i find is that like a lot of the education for you know how to write code only leave like testing for like once you've like learned all this stuff and you're like very good and you know about all about object-oriented pro programming and 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 uh and tries and, and red back trees like maybe you can go and, and do some testing but it's not it's it's really uh, a, a practice that you can integrate even as you're just starting out it's as simple as, um, you know, if you write uh, code to, to write the Fibonacci sequence, you can write code that's next to it that says the Fibonacci sequence is one, one, two, three, five, eight, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, in, in a nutshell, because a, a lot of, uh, of what we do is, uh, uh, is numeric in nature, uh, it actually lends itself pretty well for, uh, for writing uh, tests. Uh, you know, numeric code is, is, is rather straightforward to test. It has like a nice data flow, you know, from inputs to outputs. And then you can just check at the end if the thing that you got out of your function is the thing that you were expecting. Um, and you can expand that to other parts of your, of your pipeline later on. You know, as you grow, you can do things like, oh, maybe I can test my inputs, my loaders to see, you know, if they actually like load my data right. And I can test like other parts, like. Uh, later down the line, like my intermediate results, like are they okay, and so on and so forth, um, until you have you know pretty good overall coverage. But I, I think it's actually something that is very amenable for somebody that's that's starting out. And I haven't seen a curriculum uh, that like really emphasizes uh, testing from day one. But in fact, there is a statement in, in Python that's like the easiest kind of test, which is you know an assert statement. And you can teach it in the first or the second CS class that you ever take in your life. Um, so that's something I've experimented with uh, with, uh, with students in the, in the class on, on programming for VR. And I think it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting experiment. It didn't quite work, <laughs> just, you know, TLDR. Um, but that's, that's the idea. You know, you can, you can learn it like first or second class and then just use it as something that you um, that you grow on. OK, 
Okay, I'm, I'm tempted to maybe ask some other people in the panel uh, what their views are on test-driven uh, development, because I know that some people are just ardent, like, you know, in, very much in favor of this, and some other people just sort of say, yeah, I, I do test, and I do test in my development, but it's, I don't abide by, like, very strict rules of this. So if anyone has, like, any views on this, I'd be curious to hear them. So I have one that kind of links up to what Feline was saying around kind of cognitive load is that I find writing tests helps with the cognitive load. So I, when you're sometimes crafting a solution, you're not actually like, it's a, sometimes quite hard to do if you don't know what the end goal is. And when you've written a test or you've at least spec'd out the name of it and you're writing it uh, TDD, these days you, you kind of code, you have your test next to the code you're writing and you kind of um, write them together. Um, I find it really helps with that because I know it works. So I don't have to figure out, does it work, manually test it, figure out how I'm going to do that. That's already done. I can just run it and it's there. So what I really like about TDD is that it, 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 it makes me panicless because I know that I've, my code is working, it's done, it's there. Um, and that's why I'm a, a huge advocate for it. Do I do that always? No. Um, have but, you know, having done that for a couple of years, do I find that I'm better at writing, like my code almost isn't the way I uh, write code makes it more testable, which means I can actually write the test afterwards and I'm fine. Yes. And um, so it's like a practice and it's long and it's a little bit confusing and a little bit strange, um, but it's definitely useful. And I'm, if I remember back, something I wish I knew during my master's was this, is that I would, you write all this code, you run the experiments and two days later, because um, you know, the computer takes days to train or to 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 understand something to, to to run. You find an error, and now you've wasted two days. If I just had a test that had checked that little function that I, you know, added, then I would not have wasted all. Like I think I wasted months of just failed tests because I only realized after a, a huge run that that I that they'd failed or that something else had gone wrong. And if I may add to that, I think one of the reasons that reading code is also hard is because you have to recreate your mental model. So, so when you are designing something, it's very clear, like, oh, this goes there and this goes there, and those are the reasons. And if you haven't documented that in code, even if you have documented in code really well, recreating your mental model is really hard. And this is also something that tests can help with. If you have a big test, uh, that test suite, so a set of tests, and you make a little change, and then five tests fail all of a sudden, and they're all related to each other. They're all related to one function that's somewhere else in the code. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. If all those tests fail, then even though your mental model isn't complete, you get sort of a hint, like probably it's somewhere there in that direction. So that is also something I think that if you have a test suite and if you have created your code with TDD, so you have tests, then recreating your mental model can also be done through tests. You can, as Jade is also saying, by looking at the names of the tests, you already scope a little bit what you're going to do. And failing tests can also really help in recreation of a mental model. Yeah, I like how failing tests can you leave the breadcrumbs that can lead you back to the source. It's, it's, um, I discovered that and I was like, oh, wow, that really works. Um, you know, I don't know, do you want to sort of jump on this as well? And I did. That to do? I did uh, sure. Um, contrary to everyone's opinion, I, I, sometimes I think TDD is actually being counterproductive, if I'm being very honest. I don't, I don't see why that exists. And we, we, we are human beings, right? So the person that sat down or the group of people that sat down and thought about the fact that CDD is a great idea are human beings. And there are also a couple of people that will sit down and think about the fact that there's a chance that CDD is counterproductive. And if these are the two kinds of people in the world, I choose to be with the people that believe that TDD is counterproductive because I do not see why you think about writing tests before you actually start writing code. I am not by any chance saying that you should wait till the end. If you are building an app, I'm not by any chance saying that you should wait till the end of the entire app or service before you start thinking about testing. But I believe that you should try to cover your tests simultaneously as you write the code. So there are some people that have, sorry, one sec, I live close to the airport. So there's this airplane noise.
okay, as I was saying, there's some people that have um, code that they write and they have scripts that they run before every commit that they make to Git, GitHub or Bitbucket or ADO, which is Azure DevOps, depending on whatever it is that you're using. So if, for example, I run this script and I see that my test coverage is less than, I don't know, 80%, I'm not going to commit this code. Because there's a chance that I might have been writing code, I might have written some new methods, I might create some new code parts, but for whatever reason, I forgot to test those new code parts. So now you cannot commit that code without testing that. And that puts you in check. But saying that somebody should write tests before they write code, sometimes they're a bit unrealistic because a lot of times you figure out that when you are writing code, a bunch of things evolve in that process of you writing code. And at the point where you are now done writing code, you should now know exactly what this code that you have written should do and have expectations and then go ahead to test for those expectations. Like, okay, with these certain conditions, this thing should fail. With these certain conditions, I should get this result after you have written the code, not before. So I am of that school of thought. I do not subscribe to test during development for whatever reason but I am a hundred percent subscriber to the fact that you should test your code and you should try to make sure your code is covered as much as possible at any given time. So, so the one point I disagree, Adora, is the well, not disagree. It's a kind of like a common misconception, and it's because they teach TDD wrong when they teach it. Is that they say, "Oh, you got to write your test first, and then you write your code," um, whereas it's a little bit if you. Well, depending on, I suppose it depends on who, who t teaches you to TDD. And this, the way I really like is the, the kind of one where you've got your test open and your, your code open. And the goal is that at each line, you should be kind of invalidating. So when you you write the, the title of the test, which is really important because it tells you what it's doing or why it's doing it, uh, then you write a line and then your test should be failing because now you have, you're probably calling a method that doesn't exist. So then you write that line. So you kind of do them in parallel with each other. And what you're like the test driving it is you're kind of just positioning yourself in a way that makes code testable, I guess. Um, and so while I, yeah, and I completely agree with you that writing a full test beforehand, before you even get to code, like that's, you're going to end up writing two different, completely different things, but kind of writing them in tandem, I found has made me better at writing code. Um, and made me think about the user more because I'm thinking about who is going to be using this API. Um, and what does that look like from their end as a user, as I'm writing this test? Um, yeah. Yo, I think you wanted to talk and I, uh, I forgot to sort of go on stage. I accidentally talked over Adora. I felt really bad. I'm so sorry. Um, I think actually Adora really spoke to a lot of my points, which is that if you're not careful and you really only focus on tests, then you can risk just having really good tests and no code, which is not where you want to start. And like, I think Jade, you sort of addressed this point that if you teach it badly, you can focus too much on the testing. But um, I guess just being being thoughtful um, and making sure that you're doing things sensibly given the scope of a project is really important. So if it's a small project, you better not have a perfect testing suite when you've only got one week left to do the code. <laughs> Um, it's just not to say don't do tests, just, you know, make sure that you're, you're approaching it and small projects have small tests and bigger projects have bigger tests. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I was also thinking that, um, especially when it comes to, I mean, in academia, when you want people to contribute to your project and on top of that, they have to learn testing, that usually adds another layer of just, just a, a complexity that people have to learn on top of that, which when they're not familiar to testing can complicate things. Um, I'm just checking the time, and I think that maybe if there are questions, now would be a good time to um, maybe ask them. So I don't know if uh, I was um, seeing, I don't, I, have I missed any questions in the chats that were not asked, or does anyone want to just like ask a question now? Uh, there have been some questions in the chat, but I'm not sure which of those have been answered. Uh, so I can ask just... mine. Okay. Because, uh... I'll just jump in. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in, in hearing because a uh, lot of people have on the panel have are in industry versus in academia and working on academic projects or like research projects. And 
I know obviously that there in, in some in different projects there are different approaches and different things receive higher priority. So I'm wondering um, or I'm keen to to hear from your experiences which aspects are focused on more in either case that the other would be able to learn from and improve from. Um, perhaps I'll start with uh, Jade, if you want to. Otherwise, Patrick, perhaps. I'm just going to say something about testing, so <laughs> let someone else go. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I can comment on this as well. I worked in industry for a brief while and what surprised me there is teamwork. <laughs> it's like people were actually working together and the coming for academia, that was very surprising. So even though I had worked on open source projects from academia, it's always that a project is owned by one person, a PI or maybe a PhD student and it is their project. And then other people might send a pull request, right? Might help out. But there's very clear ownership of code. Because when I was working for Microsoft, I worked on Excel, which is a ginormous code base. And then everyone was like working together. And there wasn't so much this feeling of ownership um, of one person. It was very much more that everyone was feeling they were doing something together. And of course, this isn't necessarily related to clean code, but also it is related to clean code because you wouldn't have one style that's a bit quirky, but it's still maintained because the maintainer really likes it, one single owner. You get this shared ownership and then you also get a shared vision on what clean code is, either explicitly or just implicitly just by the size of the team. So from my ex brief experience uh, being in industry, I, I, of course, had this fake idea that people would work together outside of academia, but it, in terms of code consistency, it struck me how capable people work or of working together on a project. It is, this is millions and millions and millions of lines of code and hundreds of people work on the Excel code base. That was like, that was so weird for me. Yep. You know, to add to uh, uh, Felipe's uh, point, uh, I think the social aspect also of coding uh, in industry is uh, as it's just much more uh, emphasized, right? So you know, if you want to if you want to su submit to a code base like this, you have to have like uh, first of all, like you have to have like discussions with your colleagues at first about uh, about code style. Um, you know, everybody's gonna, like somebody's going to review your code. You might have uh, reading groups, you know, to like learn more about the technical aspects of, uh, of some code. Uh, you're going to have like workshops in order to become better at, uh, at some like piece of technology and so on and so forth. So uh, there's lots and lots of occasions to be social about code. And I think that as a grad student in a group that might be like six, seven uh, students, you might feel significantly more lonely than inside of this, uh, uh, inside of this big place. So if we can figure out a way to bring that, to bring that camaraderie and to bring that social support system into the, uh, the academic context, um, of course, open source is, is one way to do it. But I think it would be nice if we had like kind of a template to say like, oh, you know, you people that are in this lab or like three labs together, you can pull yourself and, you know, you can have like code review circles or like, or pair programming circles or something like that. Um, I think that that's a practice that we can take from from industry and uh, really run with it. I think Yo wanted to say something, and there's also another question in the chat, and I think maybe we should uh, keep it at that because it's almost done. <laughs> my my comment actually kind of answers um, one of the things about testing GUIs. Um, so there are non-automated ways to test a graphical user interface. Uh, so, for example, if you get someone else to sit down, give them a task and watch them do it, ask them to explain what they're doing while they're doing it, they will say, oh, I'm confused, I don't know what to do now, or they'll do weird, weird stuff. And that's a way of testing that shows where it's hard to use the stuff that you've created that allows you to then iterate and improve. Uh, it's not something that directly may, makes change in the code, but it makes it a much cleaner and more efficient and pleasant to use bit of software. I think that's the sort of thing that's dismissed as fluffy, but I think it's actually really essential if you want your, your work to be successful and to continue to be used. Any other question? 
Uh, oh, sorry. I think the question was about uh, testing GOIs. So, okay. <laughs> if anyone else wants to respond, that's, I think that's good. And then I'm, I'm tempted maybe for the for the like final round uh, to I think I asked the speaker to maybe come up with a really good pick, which could be an article, a book, or a blog, or a podcast that he would like to recommend to like the audience as something that can help them with just. Including their coding skills in general. I mean, it could be from like any of those, but there's something that when having the level that would make a difference. So I'm just going to go around and go, uh, Yo, Yo, you want to start? Okay, making sure because I misheard earlier. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to go with my UX theme. Um, and say go to the Nielsen Norman group. They write all sorts of uh, articles that are research based about how to create software and code that is easy for other people to use. Um, and like how to avoid things that you think might be good, but actually aren't like just because everyone has a carousel doesn't mean you should have an annoying rotating carousel on your website, for example. Um, and it's great. It's been running for like 20 or 30 years. It is an amazing site. Thank you. Um, Adora, any suggestions? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yep. Um, just, just if you have any kind of pick, it could be an article, a book, a blog post, a website, a podcast, anything that you would like to recommend or anything that you came across during your career that has changed the way you approached uh, the way you code, for example. Um. I don't have one thing because my a bunch of I learn every day and as I learn things, the way I in quotes code could change or not change. But I know that I spend a lot of my time reading these different O'Reilly or really I'm not sure how to pronounce them right. But those books, essentially, I spend some of my time as well taking courses from Udacity. Um, and these have like just helped me understand things. And I think the one, the one thing that has influenced how I write code the most isn't even these books or these courses, but it's mostly Twitter seeing people having conversations on the timeline and just watching these conversations go back and forth, um, being just a reader, I'm not contributing to these conversations, but just being there and what reading what people have to say and watching people go back and forth on a certain thing is something that has actually really affected how I think about things, especially when I was trying to get into the backend space and there were a lot of people talking about different backend engineering like things on, you know, on Twitter and talking about security and talking about different things. And that opened my eyes to a bunch of things. Also, one thing that has also helped me a lot is leveraging people around me. Where I work, there are a lot of people that, you know, I think are really exceptional, that I think are really smart and Picking their brains once in a while has helped me. Having conversations with my manager about things I understand and things I don't understand and where I want to get better at and how I want to see myself grow is something that has also been very important. So I would say it might never be a resource sometimes. It might just be people because I think people are the greatest resources because it's, at the end of the day, it's even those people that create those resources that you end up looking at. So having great people around you and tapping into their already existing knowledge is really priceless, if you ask me. I love that, this is awesome, thanks. Um, Jade, you wanna go next? I mean, that was such a great answer. I definitely can't top people. <laughs> but I, I did prepare a, a, a tiny list of my favorite person um, who, when I feel impostery and I feel like, which is which is a thing I think uh, everyone should be comfortable with is that you're always going to feel like you don't know everything with software. And it doesn't matter if you've been in there for, for five minutes or you've been doing it for 20 years, you're gonna get there and be like, okay, I still haven't seen all this, what's going on? Cause there's just so much and it moves too fast. Um, and what's really helped me is Julia Evans. Um, so I posted a couple of the links. There's a really nice one called Wizard Zine. Just so you want to be a wizard programmer. 
Um, and she just covers like a bunch of basic things around um, kind of what, what where you should be spending your energy, like how do you ask good questions? Uh, how can you read the source code, things like that. Um, it just makes me feel, um, yeah, I, I feel like those are the things I could have been focusing on, whereas instead I was, I don't know, I don't know what I was doing. Trying to debug things badly. <laughs> so yeah, there's my, my resource. Cool, awesome, thank you. Um, what am I missing? Uh, Patrick, you wanna go next? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I, uh, so I recently went through uh, a, a few different uh, resources to see like who had like kind of a like end-to-end -end view of how to write research code. And I think one of the most complete ones is uh, research software engineering with Python. Uh, so it goes to like everything from, uh, you know, how do you organize your code to how do you write tests for it? How do you use make files? How do you use Git? How do you use like all these, these, uh, these different things. And it's, it's written in a way that, um, I think it's, it's going to appeal to people that uh, are just starting out. So I'm going to paste it right here. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. Fantastic. And to finish, uh, Feline, you have something to suggest? Uh, clearly, I already pitched my book, so I won't do that again. But in addition to my book, which sadly cost a bit of money, I also have a free resource to offer because I, I'm one of the hosts of a podcast called Software Engineering Radio. I'll put a link in the chat. And in Software Engineering Radio, we weekly interview people from the software engineering community. So very often topics are covered that are programming languages. For example, I did an episode with Hadley Wickham, which you might know as creator of the Tidyverse to talk about how Tidyverse is designed. And we talked about other programming languages as well. But we also have episodes on clean code and refactoring and testing and database design. We have like 500 episodes. You can all also download the entire back catalog. And this is on iTunes and Spotify. So there you can really read a bit. And because programming education is so of programming is so broad there's so much to learn as Jay also was saying even if you're in there for like 20 years there are many episodes in which I am not the host that I am still learning a lot so because it's so broad also for people that aren't professional software engineers if the topic is something that you're interested in like R or refactoring then these episodes will be quite accessible to you because programming is so broad and we always aim for a broad audience as well so if you're interested in listening to me a bit more for free then you can check out my podcast as well and also my book thank you okay i think on that note uh we will uh, close it uh, we'll put it down a bit over time but uh, i think that was totally worth it um i want to thank again all the people in the company uh, thanks today it was really great to have you all uh and we can just move on